Neil is a uh, professor at the UCL Research Institute. He is an energy economist and interdisciplinary energy economist. And has been uh, working on energy models for many years, which I'm sure he will uh, tell you more about. Uh, he currently is the lead author of the energy systems chapter of the IPCC and fifth assessment report. Okay, thank you, Tad. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Um, can, can everyone see the screen? Can everyone hear my voice? Well, that's uh, that's some two things that I believe. Um, the the um, um, giving a seminar on on energy modelling. Um, has the potential to be pretty dry. And I've sat through a number of dry presentations. I indeed have given a couple of dry presentations. So I'll try not to make this dry. I should try to make this um, um, uh, relatively general and hopefully somewhat thought provoking. Um, there are no equations in this seminar, something which I am, I have angst about, but I, but I took all the equations out, but I'm very happy to uh, talk maths to anyone who actually, uh, who actually wants to. But the uh, focus of the um, presentation um, is really the interface between um, um, energy modeling and, and, and energy policy. And um, energy policy in the UK and indeed um, um, across the world is grappling with a set of unprecedented challenges, whether that's decarbonization, uh, energy security, cost effectiveness, equity, um, um, what's it like? um, If you're standing at the back, there is lots of seats at the front. It's <coughs> your punishment for coming late. And um, energy models um, provide the, the essential qualitative insight into this range of, uh, range of questions. They are the language, the framework that we use when we, uh, when we try to um, unpick some of these. Um, en energy models have a very different methodologies. And we'll go through some of them. They're targeted at very different research questions. Um, perhaps critically, energy models are built, run, critiqued, and applied by people. So models are simple, but people are not. But in the next 30 to 40 minutes, we're going to try and uh, peer into this black box uh, called energy modeling and, and uh, have a look inside. Um, I don't have any um, uh, equations, but I have punctuated them with a whole bunch of quotes, which is a uh, uh, a rather corny um, uh, um, mechanism, but one that I still use in my presentations. So let's just talk about this, uh, one of these challenges that energy models are trying to address, this decarbonized future, uh, the famous <coughs> quote by Brand in, in the Tempest, when she realizes that there is this brave new world out there uh, that isn't um, uh, just restricted to her father and, and, and his, his household. So this de decarbonized long-term world that we all look at, um, this is a poll taken by um, a number of experts uh, when we launched uh, the UK Energy 2050 project, uh, the UK Energy 2050 project. And um, the two parts of this graph show what the experts thought was possible by 2050 versus what they thought would actually happen. And it's kind of striking that uh, nearly half of the experts thought we could cut UK CO2 emissions by at least 80% by 2050. Uh, Sadly, only 7% of them thought it would actually happen. I think nothing has really improved since 2009, and the scale of this particular energy challenge um, is uh, apparent to probably everyone in this room. So let's go on to um, uh, using energy models and being an energy modeler. And to be honest, uh, it's quite difficult to be an energy modeler. I'd much rather be a particle physicist. It's really quite good to be a particle physicist. Um, so why is it good to be a particle physicist? Well, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, everyone assumes that you're an expert, and you're the only expert. You can talk incomprehensible jargon, you can use impenetrable mathematics, you can generate a completely untestable theory and sit back and relax, and that, you're, that means your career is made. Uh, <laughs> you're a bit surprised because someone gives you $9 billion to build the world's largest machine to test said theory. Um, you build this machine, and you test your theory, you announce you've found your new particle, you've not actually found it. You're just inferring from secondary or tertiary uh, results that you have found this particle. Um, you get a whole bunch of academic status, the media coverage. You don't really make any positive contribution to societal welfare, as far as I can tell. 
Uh, and then you announce that you've just opened up a new field of exploration, which requires another <laughs> lifetime of hypothesis uh, generation and uh, testing. Um, if you're an energy modeler, you just don't have that. Um, um, everyone's an expert, and I mean everyone. The taxi driver, my mother, everyone is an expert on, on energy. Um, although as you've tried to demonstrate you're an expert, you strive to be transparent, you engage with stakeholders, you constantly try to generate clear hypothesis, you target your research questions, um, no one gives you any money, you spend lots and lots of time trying to raise it. Here at UCL, we're quite successful at that, but we have to continue to be successful at that. We, can, uh, we, we, we really have to work hard to retain our expert team and make sure we don't too want to do uh, other interesting things with other groups. Um, we try to de demonstrate clear findings. We strive to ensure they can be replicated by both ourselves and other people. Uh, our, our reward for this is lots of technical papers. Uh, we try very hard to impact our research findings to be business and policy communities. And just when we think we've got everything set, the policy business <coughs> it throws up yet another problem for us. However, I am not a, a particle physicist. I am an energy modeler. So let's. Um, so, so, so let's talk about these things called energy models. So let's first talk about what energy models are not. Um, energy models are not a, a generator of either research papers or consultancy funding. They might be, but strictly speaking, that's not what they are. Um, they're not just a name based on a zipping acronym, and these are, uh, these are real models. Uh, you can have the green model or the blue model. Uh, you can have the prism model or the cube model. You can have the alpha model, the gamma model, the delta model, or my personal favorite, the albatross model, is, uh, which is uh, a uh, transport simulation model. Um, models are not an anthropogenic entity with a somewhat deranged personality, although they actually are. When you say models are difficult, models are conservative, models are flexible, models are, you know, mo the, model likes, the model tells me, my models are working, my models are working. I mean, it is easy to believe that these things become, become actual, actual people. Um, but um, 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 bad jokes aside, um, UCL's approach to modeling, and this is not a um, lecture on the theory of models and how, um, and how theory and models interact. We could have a lecture on that. This is a much more practical kind of lecture. But certainly our approach to modeling is that there will never be a universal model that, that answers all questions. Um, you do design models to answer specific research questions, and we'll talk about how research questions drive your analysis. Although clearly, once you build a very complex model, you try to appropriately apply it to new questions. Um, I'll come back to the range of models that you require and the linkage of models that you require. Um, I'll come back to uh, developing an, an expert uh, base of people who build and understand models. And I will say this again, but I think it's not to just the duty of people who build models to make them transparent and open, but it's the duty of people who use models to try to become expert, to try to become educated themselves. It's extremely hard to be a chef and talk about cooking to someone who doesn't know what, what, what an oven is. I mean, there needs to be some kind of back and forth between developers and users of models. Um, models are, are, are developed through structured contract with people contact with you, you have to test your models, you have to uh, 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 see if your insights are correct. And models are only good as the data that you use um, to postulate um, the models or the challenge. I don't like the, uh, um, the um, phrase garbage in, garbage out, because just about everything is garbage in, garbage out, um, but models are clearly uh, garbage in, garbage out. Um, one question I will come back to is whether energy modeling is a science or whether energy modeling is and I'll try to answer that. Um, a shameless plug for the models that we use at UCL Energy. You probably can't see that at the back, but it's your own fault for coming late and being in the back. There are a couple of seats further in front. Um, these are um, uh, uh, our website that we have a nice collection of different models. The UCL Energy Institute is probably the UK's largest academic group uh, looking at energy, certainly at energy modeling. And we have a range of models looking at the built environment of transport, or uh, the relationship with the economy, or the relationship with the, with the climate. And I would encourage you to look at these models. These are models designed by different people to answer different research questions with different strengths and needs. <coughs> um, so you, um, you design
decided to be an energy modeler, and you are, and you're thinking about uh, uh, um, uh, uh, using models to answer specific research questions. Um, now, the, the first question is: Is your model useful? So, my second quote is a very famous quote by George Box: um, "All models are wrong, but some are useful." Personally, I don't like this um, quote very much. Um, I don't want to say anything about George because he's both a UCL um, alum and he's also dead, so I don't want to uh, be mean to him. But I will give an alternate version. And my alternate version is some models are right, or at least in practice, right enough. And even the wrong ones can still be useful. So this is, an, this is a very practical view um, of, of how you can use models. Um, if I was to drop my watch on the floor, I could think about a simple set of uh, rules from Newtonian physics as to how my watch would fall to the floor. I don't need to worry about general relativity of quantum mechanics. My watch is not traveling at the speed of light, nor is it at the quantum scale. So sometimes the model is actually good enough. Um, and even wrong models are actually quite useful, as long as you actually realize they're wrong. Um, and perhaps the most famous one is um, the uh, uh, groundbreaking scenario work and modeling work done by Peter Mark and his team, if I said that correctly. Um, uh, when he actually went through, uh, the Shell executives had a series of steps that they thought that the world in the future would be pretty much the same as the world in the past. And he took them through a series of steps and said, okay, you, you are assuming that there's going to be no, no global instability. And you're going to be assuming this and assuming the next thing. And actually going, making them see how the model was wrong is actually a very illustrative process. So um, you're um, trying to think about um, the usefulness of the, of the model. You're also trying to think about how complex a like, model should actually be. Um, I won't um, um, break up my Latin. Um, I do have an old level of Latin, but I won't use it. Um, but certainly, um, a very famous quote uh, by the medieval philosopher William Walker, uh, which we now know as Walker's Razor, is entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity, would be a reasonable English translation. Um, and in modeling terms, this means you build a model that is, um, has elements of simplicity, um, 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 elegance, parsimony. Essentially, you make the model only as complex as it needs to be. Uh, unfortunately, the energy economic system is inherently very complex. Never mind you get into behavioral change or interactions with the physical environment. So again, you're coming back to the idea that the problem drives the modeling and the analysis. And you make the model as complex as it needs to be to answer the particular problem. So, so to have a model that you think is useful and is a, and it's at the correct level of transparency, uh, the correct level of uh, complexity, now you want to think about whether it should be transparent or not. Um, and Richard Tall, uh, a guy I like a lot, he's, an, he's a very well-known um, <coughs> economist who studies climate change, he has very strong views about climate change mitigation, <coughs> and he developed a fund model and um, I do like uh, the quote on the fund model front page. He says the fund models develop a firm belief that most researchers should be locked away in an ivory tower. Models are also are often quite useless and inexperienced hands and somewhat misleading. No one is smart enough to mask in the shop need to look it took someone else years to develop. And this is my particular favorite. Not understand that the suit models that are relevant. Half of the suit models treacherous and misunderstood models positively dangerous. Now, Richard comes from a particular um, a viewpoint, and he has quite strong opinions. But I do think that um, there are some elements to what he says. That said, here at the UCL Energy Institute, we do something completely different, and we try to make sure that our models are as transparent as, transparent as we possibly can. And <coughs> we try to communicate that through uh, <coughs> uh, making them um, open source. By that means that full documentation is available, uh, including all your data and data sources. Uh, your model source code, if you're willing to give that, is available. Uh, these models are peer reviewed, either through the normal academic journal process, or you can dedicate a bunch of peer reviewers to look at your model. Um, we are, are, are a big proponents of expert user groups, either with federal modelers or with the stakeholders um, and, and users in government industry uh, consultancy and academia. Um, and I should say at this point, to reiterate how important it is that policy makers are technically adept enough to use models. And to pick on DEC as one example, um, I very much welcome DEC's efforts to boost its own internal modeling capacity, I think. Um, um, DEC's um, and other government's departments focus on generalists is a bit of a mistake, and the fact that building up their modeling expertise, I think, is extremely good. Um, 
you need to engage with broader stakeholders, even though that may be difficult if these stakeholders have very different views from you. But, but there are limits to transparency. Um, models are valuable things, they are intellectual property. So you have to worry about that when UCL wants to make money um, uh, from via consulting projects, for example. Um, they are highly complex, they are difficult to use. We have models that take you six months before you can do anything useful with it. So you can't just give a model and expect someone to replicate what you can do. Um, the other thing you have to be careful about is, is biased attitudes towards energy modeling, and even malicious attitudes. Um, I spent many years working in the US, and in the US, the US makes Westminster look like child's play, and the policy debate is vicious. There are models for hire, people will just come in to destroy a particular point of view. Everyone's trying to make everyone into the left or the right. There are some real dangers to using powerful quantitative tools, particularly in the, in the 140 character media world that we currently live in. However, transparency is still, is, is still a goal. Um, so, you, so, you have, um, so you have a model that's uh, useful, complex enough, transparent. Uh, what do you actually do with it? Um, well, this is a very nice quote by uh, Hill Huntington. He's a professor at Stanford and runs the Energy Modeling Board. It's a big uh, a comparative model. And he says you model for insight and not numbers. And that's as true today as it was 30 years ago. But that's a bit of a problem because decision makers don't actually want insights. They actually want numbers. And they want numbers, uh, single numbers, they don't necessarily deal with uh, a particular one. And the example of some of the num numbers they want, they want to know how much stuff is in the ground, they want to know how much uh, of that stuff we actually want to use, they want to use which, they want to know which technologies that we'll actually uh, be using, they want to know costs for particular top technologies, they want to know how much money they have to invest, they want to know things like energy price increases, um, and other marginal uh, values that are actually And um, an indication of, um, of insights versus numbers is that this very, um, um, I'm not going to use the word bitter, spirited debate on the, um, on a particularly surrounding the uh, Stern review when it released its, um, um, uh, uh, and Nick Stern released this big report on the analysis of climate change. Um, so this is a comparison between uh, Nick Stern view on the, uh, cost of the, uh, the cost of climate change this is not the cost to do something about climate change, this is just the cost of climate change. Um, versus uh, Robert Mendelssohn, who's a professor at Yale. And Robert Mendelssohn published that paper saying, is a stern review and economic analysis? So for an economist to call to say that to another economist is like is like saying that your child is 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 ugly and useless. Um, uh, um, Nick Stern um, um, at the keynote address said um, Bob Mendelssohn is a gentleman and a scholar, but is flat wrong, which is also as as as, um, as, as pointed as, as a new again. Now, the point of this table is not to read each line, but just to look at the top and the bottom, which is, uh, which is in bold. Um, Stern actually found that uh, um, his analysis said that the cost of climate change would be very large indeed. And Mendelssohn said it'd actually be very small indeed. And the policy impact was for Stern is to do something quickly, and the policy impact from Mendelssohn is says, don't do very much at the moment, uh, try to learn and act later. So that's the actual number or insight, but what you actually want to get at is the individual insights from the model. So for example, um, Nick Stern, if I just work from my way up, um, up, up um, Nick really focused on extreme events and non-market impacts and things like biodiversity. And uh, Robert Mendelssohn really focused on adaptation. Now both of these are really important part of the puzzles, but it's a different focus of their analysis. Um, Nick was very much more optimistic on technological change than Robert. Um, a discounting was a big, big factor. Um, uh, Mendelssohn was using normal social discount rates um, due to um, um, risk and ethical considerations. Um, uh, Nick was not using a pure time reference. <coughs> he took that out and was just uh, uh, um, using the discount rate based on increasing uh, um, uh, utility. And there's, a, and there's a bunch of other insights within the model, but Unfortunately, the headline figures actually don't, don't, don't show you that. And when you're using models and applying models, then you should try to feed into the, uh, the insights from within the models. Um, but um, it's important to think as to where the numbers come from. Um, this is from la the, the last IPCC. Um, I wasn't involved in this, so um, none of these numbers are my fault. 
But certainly, when they're talking about 500 ppm for CO2 equivalent, which is 450 um, a part per million of uh, CO2 stabilization, they were talking about roughly a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And the GDP costs were from a small gain to 3% loss globally. And the CO2 price was 50 to $200 per ton of CO2. Uh, these days, those uh, numbers uh, particularly would, would look a little low. And most, most all modelers, particularly in the next IPCC, think that climate change uh, 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 mitigation is going to cost uh, significantly more. But these model derived numbers really give you a, a sense of where these numbers come from. And they're much better, I'm arguing, than other ways of doing it. Other ways you can do it is have to have some very simple modeling, um, dare I say it, an Excel spreadsheet, and um, go through a number of scenarios, which Ofgen did for its project discovery uh, in 2009. And they came with a range of 95 to 200 billion pounds investment required in the UK power sector by 2050. And particularly that 200 billion number has had a lot of press coverage, um, although the basis for it is relatively simple. But that itself is still an improvement on, um, for example, the EU just making up targets for, no, <laughs> for as far as I can tell, with no rhyme or reason at all. Deciding. So there's 20, 20, 20 targets in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions, um, renewable resource uh, improvements, uh, um, and <coughs> energy efficiency improvements of 20, uh, 20 also, was as far as I can see plucked from the ether. And that's not good policy making, and unless um, <coughs> our economic situation continues as badly as it has, these three targets will not be made. And, and certainly, I'm very skeptical about the renewable resource target, even under economic uh, contraction. So I'm arguing that models are really good for um, actually the, um, I, 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 I developing these insights. And I'm not expecting you to read this because I can hardly read it from here. But all this is trying to show is from the AR4, you can clearly see a whole bunch of different models. And you can look just on this figure, which comes from the um, a technical summary. You can look through time to 2100. You can look at the top one is, is, is GDP loss, <coughs> the bottom one is the CO2 emissions, and as I go uh, from right to left, then that's the target increasing, uh, getting tighter and tighter. Now, the, the nice thing about the models is you can very clearly see what's driving costs, in this case, the stringency of the target, and you can very much start to compare different models, and then you can unpick why those models are giving you different, uh, different So um, if, you, um, if you're quantifying models, you have to ask yourself, well, if these models actually give me the right answer. One thing we don't do enough of is export analysis. We don't go back and ask the models, did you, did you do what you said you would do? This is much more common in, in physical models. The big climate models are calibrated um, at least 100 years back. But um, one group that does do it is the uh, US um, EIA with their NEMS model, that's the underpinning model for a lot of, uh, um, a lot of their analyses and projections. And they have, um, this is a, a, a graph that shows every single year, they look back at the a year the forecast was made, and they look um, at, at the forecast year and say, well, in, in 1994, we forecast a given price in 2010, and we'll be right on and just two points to get across. One is quite useful to do this. Uh, this top one is, um, let me get this right. This top one is uh, total uh, amount of residential energy. So this is a quantity. And this bottom one is natural gas pricing. And one key point, point to take away is, it's much easier to get quantities right than it is to get prices right. Um, uh, this is shady, so if, it, if, if the model is, um, is in, blue, then the model um, got the number too high, and if it's in green, then the model got the number uh, too low. Uh, so if you, look at, if you look at natural gas prices, uh, the, um, no, which way around did I say that? I, 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 I'll double check, I, I actually got that the right way If you look at natural gas prices, the model consistently got the prices massively too high. So sorry, green is too high. Um, so it consistently said that natural gas prices were, were, um, were too high. 
I'm, I'm really not presenting this um, slide particularly well. Now, now I've convinced myself, I've put it the wrong way around once again. Um, let, me, let, let me look at this area. So this is most interesting because this is the collapse in natural gas prices. So the models, um, even from two years ago, was saying that natural gas prices were 80% higher than they actually were in reality. So blue is actually the model getting too high. Um, and prior to that, they had natural gas prices as being far too low because the American <coughs> economy was booming, um, uh, pollution uh, uh, control measures meant that natural gas was the fuel of choice. So prices are much harder to uh, get right than uh, quantities, which is not surprising because prices are marginal um, uh, 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 entities. They're very sensitive to small changes, whereas uh, uh, quantities are actually easier to predict on, on the basis of uh, relatively slow moving dynamics. <coughs> right. Let me let me try and not do that as bad a slide as that one and move on. Um, so we we talked about quantification. Let's have talk about model uncertainty. So you're so you're using the model and you're trying to work out whether it's right. Now, now let's talk a little bit about model uncertainty. Uh, you have to have quotes from Donald Brumsfeld because he's the quote giver's uh, um, gift. Uh, and this is very famous. There are known knowns, things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns things that we know we don't know, there are unknown unknowns, things we don't know, we don't know. So that's, um, that's Donald Rumsfeld at uh, and, and, and Walker Street War. Um, but um, certainly when you think about um, uncertainty in models, you can characterize them as being uncertainty about underlying values. Now, underlying values, whether they're changes in consumer preferences or government priorities, are extremely difficult to model. Um, a good example is the sea change in attitude towards um, uh, homosexuality. When I was growing up, homosexuality was considered wrong, it was the butt of jokes, uh, homosexuals were, were, were prejudiced against, they still are, but over the last 10 years that has changed uh, remarkably. And you can think of a whole bunch of other social changes. Um, so those are actually quite difficult uh, uh, to model. You can think about things that are, are easier to model, and uh, let's talk about um, epistemic versus aleatory uncertainty. And as of course you all know, uh, epistemic uh, uncertainty uh, is an uncertainty that comes from lack of knowledge, something that you can learn about. Uh, whereas aleatory uncertainty is truly random um, uncertainty. It's, it, it's, it is actually things that will continue to be random. Um, and I've said that you can address the former by sensitivity analysis and the latter by probabilistic analysis, because that's what we normally do. But there's actually no reason that you would have to do that, and you can use either technique um, either way. It's important to also recognize this uncertainty in model structure, and, it, and that's both in the type of model and the individual who built that model. And to investigate model structure is difficult. You can compare models. You can do model, what we call model archaeology, where we track the development of a model. There are techniques called modeling to generate alternatives. We use different formulations of given models. But modeling structure is an important source of uncertainty, not just the parameter. Um, so we've, we've gone through these elements of models. So which sort of model should, it, should you actually use? And this is a typology that I like a lot. Uh, Jean-Charles Arcard at Sarad, and uh, Marc Jucard at San Fraser in, in Canada. Um, and they're talking about models uh, being characterized by these key, three key axes. <coughs> you really want a model that has a good sense of the um, feedbacks with the macro economy and indeed the wider environment. You want something that looks at technology detail and you want something that looks at behavioral complexity. Um, if you uh, use a optimization model like our big energy system optimization models, Markal, that we're using, taking Markal to the Times platform, these are te technology rich models. If you uh, have a computable general equilibrium model, these are uh, rich in macroeconomic uh, feedbacks. Um, if you have an econometric or an agent-based model, these are models that are trying to get at how people actually behave. Um, but these models are really good on one axis and not really good on the other two. Now, unsurprisingly, a lot of our time is actually trying to take these models and increase their sophistication in a different um, um, axis while retaining their strengths in their whole axis. And 
unsurprisingly, that's the perfect energy model. And when I'm 65, I will get there and I shall return. <laughs> but there are these are five critical modeling issues that we tell all our students to worry about. Um, I won't go through them all in detail, but certainly the interaction with the macro economy, um, interaction with uh, technology, uh, behavior, and perhaps uh, these two critical things, scale, and we build models at different scales from the city to the globe, and time, and we build models that operate on a half hourly basis, and we operate on our models that run out to 2300. So you are building different models to look at different research questions. If you're trying to optimize your existing power system, you don't care about 2300. Um, if you're trying to uh, design a decarbonized energy future, you're not really worried about right now um, when you need to turn on the gas to <coughs> And when I say that energy modeling is a science or art, my answer is they're probably both. I mean, clearly these are scientific tools, but they are, they are also an art form. We are artists. Um, and different people will build different models. Um, in my experience, men and women build exactly the same model, but old and young people build different models. Developed versus developing country people build different models. Engineers and economists build wildly different models. So you have to remember that there is, um, that there is a diversity from yourself as a model. Okay, so that's the driest part of the talk over. And I'm going to move into the last third, and the, and the top gets a, gets a little bit more moist um, as we go towards it. Um, I'm going to turn to actually using our models um, in, the, um, in, the, um, in the UK, which as we're based in London is something that we do a lot. Um, and just to give you background for, um, for the people who actually aren't, aren't in Westminster, um, and although people in Westminster might not know the history either, uh, the Department of Energy, founded in January 1974, um, and was headed by a series of very prominent ministers um, and was famously disbanded in 1992. Very few departments are disbanded. They get moved around and chopped around. But um, in 1992, the energy issue was done. Um, the UK was self-sufficient in, 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 in North Sea oil and gas. Uh, the Thatcher um, uh, and government had dismantled the power of the unions. Uh, we had privatized all our, um, all our utility. They all went perfectly well. We had devolved uh, uh, control of those either upwards to Brussels or that used to be break things. Turn on the lights and go home. Come back 15 years later, turn all the lights on even brighter. You now have the Department of Energy and Climate Change. You're implementing very major parts of, um, of your legislation. You now have legally binding targets uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions <coughs> on a daily basis. Um, you have uh, energy security um, issues. We're now a net importer of energy the first time in a long time. We have real issues with equitable access uh, to energy, issues with fuel poverty, with the, um, our, our um, the most vulnerable of society, and continuing interactions in, uh, with European partners on how best to actually uh, uh, design a liberalized uh, energy system. Um, and if you look at the current debt policy framework, these are just taken uh, directly from, uh, from the debt website. But this is why it's so hard, because this is what I think these um, policy priorities mean for energy prices. So number one priority right now is to boost economic growth. And to boost economic growth, you actually want prices to go down. That would mean that we free up money to spend on other things. Um, to reduce the UK's greenhouse gas emissions, you actually want prices to go up, because then you can um, 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 reduce consumption um, of fossil fuels. Um, Countering weapons proliferation, I don't think necessarily has that big an impact on energy prices in the UK. But if we go through the other ones, we can pick out a few. Um, if you actually want to support new technologies, you want prices to go up in the short term. Um, if you want um, a household to cut their energy bills, you want prices to go down in the short term. If you want to guarantee energy security, that's probably going to be more expensive energy, and so on and so forth. So even just looking at a very first order, zero order analysis of um, energy price uh, implications, you can see how complex this actually is. Um, so let's look at um, how we've been doing. Um, and this is UK CO2 emissions from 1990 through to 2030, um, uh, historic and, and, and projected. Um, and um, in 1990, we were taking along about 600 million tons of CO2. This is CO2 only, um, of course. 
And we've been doing pretty well over the last uh, 15 years or so. Now, caveats, is that anything to do with environment policy, or does restructuring of, of our economy, dismantling of the coal industry, play a large role? Um, particularly in the last five years, um, our emissions are coming down because everything else is coming down around us. I mean, um, crashing your economy is an extremely effective way of reducing your, um, your um, emissions. So, um, although clearly policy, uh, the policy priority has to play a role in that, but not all of that. The other thing, of course, is off, uh, is uh, leakage of emissions uh, to manufacturing centres around the world. Now, um, just in terms of CO2 emissions, now we're looking at projections using the uh, UEP, which is run, uh, which is uh, generated by DEX econometric model, and also has a simple dispatch model for power generation. And just I want to mention a couple of things. Uh, one, um, they build in all of their policies up to date, and they assume that the policies are going to work. Now, I'm not saying that they won't work, but they might not work. Now, my favorite example is there is a policy to make bus drivers drive slower, therefore save fuel. Now, if you've been on a London bus today, you'll know that your London bus <coughs> driver did not drive slower. He or she drove as fast as they possibly could and braked as hard as they possibly could get away with. But um, if you're looking at baseline policy and you add in additional policies, so all of our new policies um, on the electricity sector or the green deal, and you add in high, high fossil fuel price assumptions, which we actually are, it really looks like we are on the CCC's uh, budget trend to reduce our CO2 emissions. Now, I would argue that this is a dangerous graph because I'm skeptical that we are actually on this trend. And I'm ske skeptical for a number of reasons. One, the fact that um, uh, I'm not convinced that policies will either be maintained or they will be 100% effective. And the other is when we come out of recession, and we will come out of recession, um, is how we come out of recession. Do we rebalance our economy away from banking to manufacturing? If we do, that will have a significant impact on our economy. So um, if, you are, um, um, if you are thinking about trying to uh, analyze this then models give you a key set of tools that you can do it. And um, I'll bring spells back with the second quarter of the evening. When asked about uh, the American army uh, going, into, um, going into Iraq, and someone suggesting he had a few too many cruise missiles and a few too little military police, he famously said, well, you go to war with the army you have. And that's essentially what we do with energy models. We try to build our capacity, but we are trying to use the UK's um, uh, um, existing set of, of energy models and this is much better than it was 10 years ago but the UK is still lagging behind what other countries have in its arsenal of different modeling tools and remember different modeling tools are addressing different needs such as this. Um, and to go through some of these uh, macroeconomic models such as um, at Strathclyde or the University of Cambridge or Cambridge Econometrics, input output models such as the University of Leeds, um, integrated assessment models with the climate, such as at, at Cambridge, econometric models, I've mentioned that one already, energy system optimization models, such as the ones that uh, we use at UCL, or for example, the ETI using the ESME, accounting models with the debt calculator. Uh, the debt calculator, calculator is an extremely simple tool, but it is still uh, valuable um, as an accounting framework. Um, really detailed models of electricity and gas uh, network models, and I just wanted to mention here that it's surprising how much capacity is not in academia. The government has a lot of modeling capacity. Um, uh, groups that like um, Redpoint, uh, I can see Oliver Ricks there. Um, these consulting houses have an awful lot of uh, in-house capacity, as indeed do a large uh, companies such as those represented by the ETL. And we can talk about transport models, uh, building stock models that and others um, have, a, have a lot of interest in. But the real challenge is funding these things. Um, building them takes a long time. Maintaining them takes a long time. No one wants to pay it. And you actually have what I call the strapping three-person rule in a model. You must have three people to run any model, because one guy has just arrived and one guy's new. And you need that continuity of, of staff and funding uh, to actually uh, go through this process. Um, I said that we were doing better at getting more models into the UK system, and that's true. So my second plug of the evening is for the Wholesome um, uh, Consortium, the Whole Systems Energy Modeling Consortium that, that, that I lead. And this is a groundbreaking 
uh, four-year initiative between ourselves, Cambridge, Surrey, and Imperial College London to build models. And it's very rare to get money to just build models. Um, and not only are we building models, but we are linking these models, and we are um, have a whole set of outreach uh, processes to train people, to educate people, to uh, interact with uh, uh, stakeholders uh, across the UK and internationally. And we're focusing on four things. Um, energy demand, uh, technological change, um, energy infrastructures, not just electricity, but gas, hydrogen, biomass, heat, and interactions with the physical system and with the economic system. So we are, um, we are building, um, um, we, are, we are building these new tools, but let me just close with talking about some of the results from um, one tool that we've used a lot, and this is Markal. Markal is a big energy system optimization model. It's, um, it, it's, it, it's going off to the sunshine home for its high models and being replaced by the Times model, which is our, sort of our successor platform. But one thing Markal has done is underpinned just about every major energy policy document over the last few years in the UK. And that is starting with the uh, Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution and their voluntary target on CO2 of 60% through to the legislated 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And in between that, the government was trying to work out what target to set, and I have lots of different energy white papers. And after that, the government was trying to work out how on earth to meet these targets, and how to meet the Committee on Climate Change's recommendations. And we have underpinned that, and we have started off with relatively simple models, and then introduced more complex variants um, to try to answer specific research questions. So a macro model to, to understand the interactions with the economy, an elastic demand model to try to get that behavioral change in some detail, a stochastic model for uncertainty. Uh, we now have a, a other models such as a <coughs> global model, as my colleague, my Gabriel Anandarija, at the back, and that's all that. And the idea is that these models are not just underpinning um, policy, but are being specifically developed to answer new and of course, we've published lots and lots of research papers, uh, which as academics is our bread and butter and something that we need to, to do, because otherwise the um, UCL and other UK institutions are not seen as world-leading institutions. And I think UCL is now seen in this field as a world-leading institution. So let me close with some actual outputs of this model. Uh, and I said that there were no equations, but that doesn't mean that there can't be a picture. Um, so this, this is our UK Markal model. It's a very, very large model. It has a million data points. Um, but essentially what it does, it takes a whole bunch of information on energy sources, technologies, environmental constraints, policies, so on and so forth, cost efficiencies, a whole bunch of other parameters, runs it through an enormous um, linear optimization. It optimizes it on cost, to try and find a cheaper system, and spits out a whole bunch of information on energy demands, primary and final electricity, uh, electricity Generation, prices, marginal prices, you name it. Um, the model I'm going to show you has a very simple <coughs> macro uh, module as well. Here we're trying to maximize utility, which uh, in this case is the law of consumption. And um, essentially what the model does is you must pay more for, for energy from this big Markel model. The macro module has to substitute um, away from energy by spending more, by uh, uh, um, substituting either capital or labor. Once you start um, substituting capital, um, then uh, your investment drops, and if your investment drops over the long term, your consumption drops. And this is just a very simple tool to try to see how uh, changes in the energy system and the price of energy flow, th flow through to the broader macro economy. If you're a true macroeconomist, you think this is a very simple model. If you're an engineer, you think it's a very So um, um, my penultimate slide um, uh, is just looking at some of the costs from this model. I'm just going to show you four scenarios, a central one, and then three ones with improved endogenous technological change, higher fossil fuel prices, and accelerating energy efficiency. Um, and just a couple of points to make. Um, in the short term, uh, the biggest gain you can actually do is improve accelerating energy efficiency. Um, really, in terms of depending on how you define the potential for energy efficiency, there is a large pool 
of low or even negative cost uh, mitigation opportunities uh, in the UK and various end use sectors. Um, just looking in the long term, this model is finding for these scenarios between two to three percent um, annual on an annual basis reduction in GDP. This is not a reduction in GDP growth rates, this is just a reduction in GDP overall. But two to three percent is a is a reasonable figure in China's model. But um, um, I just wanted to put this in context. So this is trying to put <coughs> the cost of mitigating climate change against every, everything else that we, that we spend on. And all of these costs are real costs in 2010 pounds. Um, all of the comparative numbers are shamelessly uh, pinched from the appendix of David McKay's book. Um, and it, the columns are, um, total cost now, the total cost in 2050, the cost per person in the UK now, or the cost per person in the UK in 2050. Um, so UK GDP at the moment is about 1.4 trillion pounds. Um, if it grows again, and it hopefully will grow again, that's why the asterisk is there. Um, by 2050, our economy should be about 3 trillion pounds. If it grows at 2% or so over the next 40 odd years. Um, that means instead of uh, individually us, uh, uh, um, our GDP per capita being about £23,000 per person in the UK, we should all be much richer. Our, 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 our GDP per capita should be about £50,000. So put that in, in, in um, relationship with um, meeting this uh, target. This is not a full uncertainty range, uh, but 2 to 3% of GDP is 60 to $90 billion, sorry, billion pounds per year. That's not an uncertainty range, that's just for these four scenarios that I showed. Which is, per person, about 1,000 to 1,500 pounds per person per year. Now, do you think that's a large number or not? Probably depends who you are. If you are, if you are an elderly person living on a state pension, that's a very large number indeed. If you're an extremely well remunerated professor, that's not a very but let's put it in context. Um, in terms of final energy, uh, we uh, spend about 75 billion pounds in the UK. If that grows at the same rate as uh, our economy, there's an asterisk there because we may decouple energy and economic growth. But we'll, but we'll be spending, um, uh, um, instead of 1,200 pounds per person, about 2,700 pounds per person per year. So that's all your heating, all the fuel you put in, in your car, and the energy body in your so the total amount you spend on energy would go up by about 50%. Now that doesn't seem very much until you start looking at some other things. You can look at the health budget, um, assuming that grows at the same rate as the economy, and that's not true because health costs are spiraling. Um, by 2050, we'll spend about 5,000 pounds per person. So that's somewhat comparable to uh, our energy consumption, and indeed is more than we would be spending in 2050 on education. At the moment, we spend about £1,000 per person educating our children, and in 2050, that might double. But that, but, but that gives you a sense of, of where decarbonizing the economy stacks up against health and education. So it's comparable. Now, these are not strictly one-to-one -one comparison, but it's, 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 it's illustrated, right? But, but then let's start having a little bit more fun. Let's look at the UK bank bailout. This is the one-time cost. It's very hard to work out how much it is. But a reasonable estimate would be 500 billion pounds. This is an eye-watering 8,000 pounds per person. Everyone in this room gave the UK banking sector 8,300 pounds. So this is serious. Um, let's look at something else. Um, uh, BP, Shell, and Exxon make between 10 to 40 billion dollars a year. I put a hashtag next to BB because after it ruined the Gulf of Mexico, it's not been making so much money. Um, nuclear decommissioning, if you wanted, and we need to, decommission the original set of Magnox and PGR reactors in the UK, that's going to cost us 760 pounds each. For nothing, just to get rid of these things. That's how much decommissioning will cost. Uh, we are having a new set of nuclear weapons, 260 pounds each for nuclear weapons. Do you think that's a, a good use of your money? And this is my favorite. We currently spend 150 million pounds on renewable energy R&D in the public 
uh, sector through the research councils and uh, direct government spending, which is a whopping 250 per person. Now, if you really think that the challenge of decarbonisation is as big as I would lay it out to be, we need to spend more than two, two pounds fifty. But um, with that, I'm trying to put some of these costs for models in perspective. Um, I'm going to leave, leave you with my last quote of the day, which is my favourite one um, by Bertrand Russell, and it particularly applies to Asian models. With that, I'll upload. social scientist sort of broadest sense. Um, really interesting talk. Um, I was interested about how you set out how modeling the beginning of modelers should be experts in the use of models. But um, what I'm wondering is the degree to which you need to bring in a sort of a, a sort of wider cohort of other kinds of experts to inform the modeling and to what extent and you think that's in UCL. So I'm thinking social scientists particularly around behavior and social structures. I I, I think that's a very fair point. Um, at UCL, the Energy Institute, we're particularly lucky because we are inherently interdisciplinary. So we have economists, engineers, and social scientists in the same department. And we have some fantastic conversations and intellectual exchanges. So we do do, do that at a daily level. But then you should, yes, do that with people from other, um, for, for, from other uh, disciplines and other stakeholders. And people don't do that enough, and you should do it. Andrew Ross from Global Garden. At the head of the Markle model, you have um, environmental constraints. That's an absolutely massive arena of uncertainty. How do you bring in the externalities of the loss of biodiversity in forests and oceans in any form? You're right, and it is a massive um, um, uncertainty. Um, now, you can try to characterize that uncertainty. And that's what we do try to do. Um, I would argue that you cannot necessarily probabilistically characterize that because you really don't know what the shape of the distribution is. But clearly, you can do a parametric analysis. So if it's externalities on market impacts, you might have a good sense of what an impact it is on the agricultural sector. But if it's impact on biodiversity, I mean, how much would you pay to save the polar bears versus how much would I pay? That might be very different. One thing you can do is run these models with things like different um, uh, externality costs. And these different costs may be orders of magnitude different and see how the model reacts to it. Um, we try to do that. We probably don't do, do enough of that, particularly with the breadth of uncertainty that you could look at. Because you might see systemic collapse, one amplifying another. Um, you can. Um, Often these models will have these positive feedbacks, but often they're negative feedbacks if I've gotten the wrong, the, the right way around. So if fossil fuel prices go sky high, and you shift away from fossil fuels, and eventually the system gets a new equilibrium, even if that equilibrium is much less optimal than it was before. Actually, modeling these sort of runaway positive feedbacks is a little bit harder. You had a graph of UK CO2 emissions historic to 2030, low fossil fuel prices, high fossil fuel prices, we had a baseline policy starting, they were all falling. And I, while actually this talk is primarily about the, 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 the use of modeling, how to use good models and how to make good models, nevertheless I feel very wary about uh, seeing a graph like that. I mean, the government has just Changed the game entirely <coughs> in the, uh, all the 30 new fossil fuel power stations. They've abandoned six, the, all the six nuclear power stations. They've cut the photoelectric uh, feeding tariff. They've uh, said end of story to wind turbines. I mean, this sounds like a huge rise in fossil uh, in, in carbon emissions. Uh, I, 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 what would, I mean, I realize this is not primary goal of your talk today, but is there not a, a huge mistake there? Well, um, one, it's not my model, so I, I don't need to defend the actual model itself. 
Um, although certainly my point that quantities are, are easier than prices to predict. The fact that we do understand certain things about how the uh, UK's economic structure is changing, the impact of a raft of policies on the on the electricity and wider energy mix that we have gives more confidence to us having a little less carbon in the system in years to come than we do now. Now, whether it's enough less, whether we go down fast enough, is a, is a different question. But I would, clearly you can, have, you can have model runs that your carbon emissions go up. But with all the underlying parameters that you put into a scenario, that's, that's quite hard to I don't know whether I can ask you to give us a heads up as to your work on AR5 at the beginning. Um, or the committee that you're leading. Well, the, the, um, um, the second order draft is available. I mean, it's, it's available for, for public comment. People like my colleague, Paul McKeppel, commented on lots of chapters, not mine, thankfully. Um, uh, I mean, one of the headline figures is, not surprisingly, the longer you delay meaningful the more expensive the system That's, that's uh, as we concertina uh, uh, the time we have to, to, to solve stabilization targets. Um, one other headline thing is, is the importance of zero, sorry, the importance of negative emission technologies. If you really want to get serious about climate change, you don't have time to do it, and you have to wait a long time, you're going to go for biomass with CCS. Uh, the other thing that's new this time is they're just game changing. So shale gas could be a game changer. Fukushima could be a game changer. So I would encourage you to read the book. Could you uh, introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry. My name is Greg Schreiber from the Energy Safety Trust. Um, so I, I, I work with the Space for the Energy Safety Trust. Um, I have enough difficulty working within the organization of the numbers that we produce to uh, kind of give make sure that everything is appropriately caveated just for savings that we might give people a back cavity all the time. Um, I think with models as a temptation for things to be presented as politically neutral fact, how do you find when you're dealing with working with policy makers that that's a way to um, ensure that you're making a whole, quite a lot of assumptions which the, the, your, your audience might not fully understand? How do you make sure that they are fully aware of the, the implications of those assumptions? Um, you have to be clear on the assumptions that you, you make. Um, you have to demonstrate that the modeling approach that you have is rigorous and grounded in whatever disciplinary or interdisciplinary goal that you have. Um, you, you essentially need to demonstrate to a number of different groups at different levels the validity of your assumptions. So, Expert, real experts, either your fellow academics or the experts in government or in industry. Um, if I was talking to the CEO of EDF, for example, um, he, he will have a person who is their technical expert. So I, I need to have a much deeper conversation with that technical expert in order for that technical expert to give the nod to the CEO, who will not only understand the broad assumptions that they see reasons, that this is a good approach and a good set of assumptions. But it's a, it's a it's a constant <coughs> process. There is no better answer than you. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I've been involved in very quickly looking at some tech models, um, uh, including, for instance, the um, uh, tag model. Um, I didn't even know where to begin with it. You know, it was a big Excel spreadsheet of 10, 12 minutes in the on my way around it, there was no kind of structure to it, apparently to me as an outsider. Are there any kind of best practice guidance for how you should set up, um, you know, steer, you know, give help to users of um, models like that? I'm tempted to say don't use Excel. Yeah, we a reasonable start. I mean, I, I, mean, I mean, some of the principles that you explained at the top, I mean, make it as Simple as possible, but as complex as as necessary would be would be a useful starting point. Um, clearly, document you know start start documenting from day one, uh, particularly your not just your data but also your uh, assumptions. Um, 
iterate with like-minded and non-like-minded people to get to get by. Um, but it, but again, it's an iterative, cyclic process, and the more complex the model you get, the the bigger the necessary buy-in from people like yourself who independently assess things um, should be. And clearly, some models are black boxes, and some models are grey boxes, and all our models are at least grey boxes. So you can at least get a get a handle on them. I mean, they aren't just say, "What is this thing?" Right? Um, can you just follow up on that actually? Because uh, one of the issues with that particular model was that it was actually designed originally to try to evaluate different policy options for uh, back in 2009 for you know, what policies they would go through. It was then subsequently used uh, when it was transferred from the or whatever, by death, to actually model the feeling power for this. And there was a kind of lack of transparency in that process in terms of the, you know, what. Um, how that then altered it, you know, what parameters they changed and so on. Uh, things like your marker modeling are pretty publicly transparent, but there are a lot of models being used in that and which are not public or not really available in that sense. I, I, I mean, you've impacted on a number of key things. I think continuity is important. Models go from people to people and from organization to organization. Um, through the history of the markup model, we've had an expert user group that we've given the model, we've pulled the model back, we've published new documentation, we've said this is version 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and we've gone through that process. We've only had the, the, the ability to do that through anchoring funding via the UK Energy Research Centre, and we'll have it with our models uh, to go forward and do the wholesome project. Otherwise, you know, with the best intentions, um, you know, uh, 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 policy makers or the, the decision makers in the industry don't want to fund this sort of you know, you know, clear quality assurance continuity of models. So it, it's a continual challenge. It seems to me that this whole area of modeling as a series of products is really experience as far as government is Do you think you have a greater chance of convincing policy makers of the validity of the outcomes and outputs of the models if there was an advice for national model standards? rules that people would have to adhere to before they were allowed to come to the public domain with their outcomes. I'm, uh, I'm a bit free market when it comes to the models. <coughs> so, so thinking about you know regulating models in, in, in any way is, it seems a little odd to me. I mean, what I will say is the efforts that DEC and other departments have done in boosting both their energy modeling internal capacity and thinking about quality assurance across the piece is most helpful. Um, I know um, John Roberts and his colleagues from DEC who have come across from uh, Justice, I believe, are very much interested in quality assurance, which most good modelers should do in, um, and I think that's going to be better. I'd rather not go any further than answering your question. <laughs> I'm Jason Palmer from Kevin Hill, Kevin Hill Culture Research. It's a follow-up question really to the, um, the idea of building and of finding models over time. Um, as is, what, at what point do you decide to put the model to sleep? As we said, we just about to put a marker behind you and a new model to the times. Yeah. And why did you make that decision? Why can we no longer work with this well respected and well known marker? Why do you do something else? Uh, I mean, if you build models to answer a specific research question, and we have tried, within the, the, um, the limitations of the marker code, to as I say, have different versions that ask that a different research question. We, were in, in conjunction with uh, institutions around the world, have developed a new times code because it just has more functionality. So it's 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 just I mean it's like a formula one team. You, you you fiddle with your car enough until it's just not putting new bases anymore, and then you and then you build a new. Car. My name is Alec Waterhouse. I've just recently become the head of the central modelling team in DEC. Um, one, of the, one of the things I wanted to refer people to uh, was the recent uh, piece of work that was led by from the Treasury, which is actually a central review of the analytical modelling that's done across government. And part of that is a series of recommendations about modelling best practice. They're not as prescriptive. I think you find that they're not as prescriptive as saying exactly what you do in any situation. But they are, uh, gives a series of recommendations that once implemented, we have a policy that will enable us to uh, 
and they were all paint modeling, and I'd commend it to anybody who's actually modeling. There's a series of uh, seven or eight things that you can actually do, and within sure, they won't make good models, but they'll prevent you from making as many mistakes as you would do without them. I think that's uh, well <coughs> worth looking at. There, the, the uh, publication's free and available on the, uh, the Treasury's website. Uh, similar around the, 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 the combined in Power Association. Um, it was really interesting talk. Uh, one of the things that we um, have encountered uh, is the concept of paralysis by analysis, whereby the determination to bolt everything down within a model, particularly in our discussions with smart energy climate change, have led to a situation whereby the continued analysis and the continued refinement and continued disagreement between stakeholders of the reality of something, uh, of, of, or the, the, the realistic nature of an output, for example, has led to a situation where over a period of years, nothing happens. So it never gets translated into any policy because everyone's going, well, not quite sure yet. So where do you draw the line? What's the, per the point of it? You say, you know, we've got enough, and it isn't perfect, and it never will be, but we stop. I mean, I, 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 I don't like looking back in hindsight to look at my old models because then I think that they're not very good. But at the time, they were the best that was available. And we need to make decisions with the, with the models and insights that we currently have. I think it's, it is a bit of a judgment call in, in what, on the way to stop. I mean, I mean, you would think that you have to characterize the, you know, the, um, the key aspects of any problem we're looking at. And part of that, we do a lot of it, is to have stakeholder engagement with people like CHP and others. So if I said, I've got a new model of the electricity sector that doesn't, that, that, that doesn't have a very fine time detail, because we know electricity, you need to have a very fine time detail, that model would not be fit for purpose. So you're trying to think of these key elements for any given research question that you have to get. And although decision makers can use models as excuse not to act. Maybe it's in the modeler's um, uh, interest to stop doing analysis rather than just say, this, this is this is the numbers. Sorry for the Okay, uh, before we uh, thank Neil for his uh, insightful and entertaining presentation on the very important topic of uh, energy modeling, I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, well, you're welcome to come up and have a, a, a drink of nibbles upstairs. The building officially shuts at seven o'clock and so uh, the doors may be locked that you can come down, which means you, you need to get somebody from the Energy Institute to help you out of the building. So if you're staying on for a long period of time, then do just ask around for somebody from the Energy Institute and they will come down and interact. So I'd like to thank Neil for his presentation.